Thank you for joining us today for another presentation of Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. I want you to know that I pray daily for your spiritual welfare. Our hope is that every viewer will have the strongest possible relationship with God. When we bought our house in Texas seven years ago, we were excited to get new furniture. Joey and I picked up the furniture and headed home. On the busy highway, my heart sunk when I saw our new love seat tumble off the back of the truck. I couldn't believe my foolish mistake. You know what a horrible feeling it is to lose something valuable, something precious. It's devastating, and we've all been there. Anxiety, fear, sorrow, embarrassment, frustration. I was experiencing them all. Traffic was heavy after dark. Trying to retrieve the love seat was going to take too long. I had to go to the next exit, make a U-turn, go a couple exits down, make another U-turn, and then back up on the on-ramp to the area of the accident. A number of thoughts raced through my mind. Number one, the furniture may be destroyed. What a waste. Number two, somebody could get hurt. Number three, the police are going to give me a tongue lashing and a whopper ticket if I don't get the love seat before they get to it. Ugh, more money wasted. Poor stewardship is one of my pet peeves. Number four, how can we retrieve it without getting hurt ourselves? And number five, the biggie, what will I tell Louise? Thankfully, the love seat was on the shoulder instead of on the middle of the freeway. And the young officer who got there before I did did not shame me nor give me a ticket but was sympathetic and helpful. We loaded the love seat, tied it down securely, and were relieved when we got home to see that the damage was so minimal that, most importantly, Louise couldn't even see it. And, you know, I was much more excited to get the furniture home than I would have been if everything had gone smoothly. And that is how it is when something of value is lost and later found. Jesus shares three lost and found parables in Luke 15 that teach this and other crucial spiritual lessons. It's easy to be so absorbed with Jesus' actual stories that we can lose sight of the background that moved Jesus to share these parables. Why does he tell these stories? Look at Luke 15, beginning with verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. Jesus tells these parables primarily to defend his kindness toward the deplorables who had come to hear his teaching and to reprove the scribes and Pharisees for their attitude for criticizing Jesus for this kindness. The prodigal son, after our song.
Jesus' first two parables appear to serve as introductory parables. Their purpose seems to be to introduce and reinforce the basic principle, as Alexander McLaren puts it, that a human instinct that prizes lost things because they are lost has something corresponding to it in God and so to vindicate the conduct of Christ. Luke 15, verse 4 through 6. Jesus says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Jesus' listeners could feel for a man who had a hundred sheep and lost only one. No one would stay put and say, ah, no big deal. I've got 99 more. No, that one lost sheep was so precious, they would search madly for it, never questioning if it was too much trouble. And when he found it, it was a time of great celebration to be shared with friends and neighbors. Jesus shares another story about finding something valuable that was lost. Verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. When the woman finds one of her ten silver coins that she had lost, She invites her friends and neighbors to share in the time of great jubilation. Well, now that Jesus has piqued his audience's curiosity, he presents the main parable that is so well known. Verse 11, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. As is so common in our youth, the self-absorbed younger son saw only his own wants. His first three words say it all. Father, give me. Give me, give me, give me. The prodigal son's discontented entitlement attitude in an environment of abundance is a fitting metaphor for American culture in 2023. I don't care about anybody else. Just give me more. I need more, more, more. What a heartbreaking experience for parents and grandparents to see such selfish ingratitude. Independence is a positive, but only when it's sought at the right time, in the right way, and for the right reason. On the one hand, we see an independent spirit, which can be positive. On the other hand, we see insolence. The young man's don't need you. I got this approach, we'll do him in, in short order. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Anytime in the far country, away from the father, is time wasted. Have you been wasting your life like the prodigal? Incidentally, the word prodigal means wasteful. Wasted years. Wasted years, oh how foolish, as you walk on in darkness and fear. Turn around, turn around, God is calling. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. As you wandered along on life's pathway, have you lived without love a life of fear? Have you searched for life's great hidden meaning? Or is your life filled with long, wasted years? Search for wisdom and seek understanding. There is someone who knows and always hears. Give it up, give it up, the load you're bearing. You can't go on in a life of wasted years. Pitiful that the young man lost so much money and blew so much valuable time that he could have been spending at the father's house. But much more disturbing is that so many today get stuck in the far country. They're never able to free themselves from the bondage of the world. The difference in serving the Lord 
and serving the devil is illustrated when we compare the words of the shepherd's psalm with the words of the prodigal here. Psalm 23, verse 1, of course, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The prodigal, the Bible says he began to be in want. Young people especially need to be wary of voices in the world that urge you to get free from the constraints of Christianity, free from godly living, purity, sobriety, church attendance, prayer, Bible reading, so that you can have time to enjoy the so-called good life of drinking and drugs, pornography, free sex, and all day Lord's Day having fun. Friends, that big party is as much a mirage today as it was for the prodigal. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. And the wrong friends will hurt you spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Never forget how Scripture exposes the emptiness of evil influence in 2 Peter 2, 19. While they promise them liberty or freedom, they themselves are the slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Back to our text in verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. What a pitiful scene. Oh, there's fun in sin. But sin always leaves a nasty aftertaste. It's just a matter of time. The prodigal never imagined his journey to the far country would tie him to a hog pen, slobbering over slop. Remember, for the Jew... Just how shameful would be such an end. The writer speaks of the pleasure of sin in Hebrews 11, verse 24 through 26, but adds it is just for a season. It's temporary. It's fleeting. And the pain is just around the corner. The STDs, the unwanted pregnancies, abortions, divorces, alcoholism, jail, unemployment, car repossessions, house foreclosures, broken lives, and broken bodies. Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. Oh, yes, the devil makes big promises. But in the end, he always pulls a bait and switch. Why? He doesn't care about you. He does you wrong because he hates you and wants you in misery here and hereafter. Finally, the prodigal wises up. All sin really is insanity. And he finally sees clearly. It makes no sense to put distance between ourselves and the Creator, the Father. The prodigal learned the difference between perception and reality. His perception, the far country, holds far greater potential than the Father's house. Oh, so much more out there. The reality? Our cup overflows at the Father's house with an incomparable bliss that the world can't touch. Luke 15, verse 17, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Reflection. Finally, he experiences self-awareness. How foolish I've been. He came to himself indicating he had been beside himself. I hurt myself most, even from a worldly perspective, whenever I turn away from God. Now, the prodigal realizes he had forfeited the best life possible, and it's time to abandon the filth. True joy, peace, and contentment, he sees, is found not in the the far country, But at the Father's house, he says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my Father and and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Prodigal's vision is restored, even has a dose of humility. Reflection, remorse, oh, those are steps in the right direction, but they're not enough. 
If we can find godly sorrow in our heart, it may lead to the required repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. The change of heart that leads to genuine change of life. The prodigal appears now to have the proper resolve. He realizes the need for contrition, for confession. Father, I have sinned. Christians are assured, thankfully, in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The prodigal offers no half-souled confession, blaming everyone else and everything else for his blunders. We do that sometimes, don't we? Some prodigals would point fingers at the older brother, at his far country friends, at his hog farmer boss. The image is conveyed by the far country and even the father. But not this prodigal, not now. He comes clean. I have sinned. My dad established three congregations in Mexicali, Mexico in the 1970s. I remember a conflict developing between two sisters in the congregation. It lingered. Finally, in response to a sermon, during the invitation song, one of the ladies, think of it, got down on the rugged concrete floors. On her knees, she crawled to the other sister. No doubt leading her knees to bleed. When she got to the other sister, in tears, she begged for forgiveness. Now, you know how that was received. It melted the sister's heart and reconciliation was achieved. Now, friends, that was true contrition. And that's what we see in the prodigal. That very scene needs to be repeated by hard, calloused brothers and sisters in churches all across the land. No, not that anyone has to literally get down on their knees, but that that same spirit needs to be demonstrated. Don't think that your half-hearted confession will slip by God. He sees whether you have genuine repentance, and he knows if your confession reveals the feelings of your heart. One common misunderstanding in religion is the true meaning of repentance. When I ask people what repentance means, even people who seem to know a lot about the Bible, the most common response I receive is, well, repentance is to be sorry. Being sorry falls way short. We see how thorough God expects our repentance to be in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 11. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Nothing iffy, nothing half-baked, nothing uncertain here about the repentance God is seeking. Friends, it's all out. Leave nothing behind. Complete turning away from sin. It's an abhorring of that which is evil within us. Romans 12, verse 9. Luke 15, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The graphic intensity depicted of God's love touches me on a deep level, doesn't it you? The prodigal may have experienced dread or trepidation as he thought about the kind of reception he deserved. But the father had been waiting, looking through the telescope of his love for his son's return, longing, looking, running. Now, the father would not join the prodigal in the hog pen, oh no. But when he saw his son turn and come home, he ran to meet him. The father had compassion. Is that your response to the prodigal who returns? Or are you more like the older brother? Of course, the father's response fits precisely with the other lost and found parables. Luke 15, 7, 
And verse 10, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Verse 10, likewise I say to you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus doesn't say merely the joy of angels, but joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents, over your repentance. Oh, how God loves you and me. There was no holding back on the Father's part. One man said, God's giving always follows his forgiving. Sadly, we may max ourselves out when we forgive, if we can but do that. Notice the Father's response in contrast. Luke 15, verse 22 the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And They began to be merry. Ignore the older brother response that you may receive from some when you come back to the father's house and know that if as a Christian gone astray, your repentance and confession are genuine. The Father celebrates your return. Isn't it time for you to come home? A young man who once thought he had all the answers had abandoned his parents on bad terms and had gone to San Francisco to chase his dreams. But before very long, he was out of money, out of friends, out of options. He had hit the bottom, he was at his wit's end. Finally, he wrote home to his parents, Dear Mom and Dad, I have sinned deeply against you and against God. There is no reason for you to love me or to welcome me back home. I am at the bottom of the barrel. I have nowhere to turn. I need desperately to come back home. I've been given a ticket for a train. It comes around the bend and right past our farmhouse. If it's okay and I can come home, please put a white towel on the clothesline. If there's no towel there, I'll understand and move on. He shared his story with an older gentleman sitting across from him who listened with pity. As the train came closer to home, the young man became increasingly nervous, filled with dread over the potential of well-earned rejection. He paced up and down the aisle of the train he sat back down momentarily next to the man and said, Sir, around this next bend, there's going to be a farmhouse on the left, a white house, an old red barn behind it, a dilapidated fence. There'll be a clothesline in the yard. I can't bear to look. Would you tell me if there's a white towel hanging on the clothesline? After what seemed like an eternity, with the young man's heart racing, the man said, Son, you better look clothesline was covered with white towels. The oak trees were covered with white sheets. The barn roof was covered with sheets. The old dilapidated fence was covered with white sheets. There were sheets everywhere. What a beautiful illustration of the father's love and his eager reception toward the lost son who returns. Friend, that's God's response to you if you will just come to him, or if you will just come home. Stay with us to learn how you can get a copy of this message after our song.
Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray you've heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like a copy of The Prodigal Son, ask for number 1424. You may also request the Truth Freeze Bible Course that you can complete at home. Get the Let the Bible Speak app or visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos, hear audio, and read transcripts of the program at your convenience. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye, and may God bless you.